Rural America was struggling long before the coronavirus pandemic hit, and the Center on Rural Innovation, based in Heartland, Vermont, and with another hub in Springfield, Vermont, has been engaged with finding solutions to bring economic prosperity and job opportunities to non-urban areas. Often these are towns, like Springfield, Vermont, that were once prosperous communities, which saw well-paying manufacturing jobs and others disappear, leaving behind smaller populations and quieter downtowns. A few months ago, the news project traveled to the Center on Rural Innovations Hub at Springfield for a discussion with its founder and executive director, Matt Dunn. With the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic, we thought it might be a good time to check back in with Mr. Dunn to learn more about what he's seeing on how the pandemic is affecting rural communities, both here and elsewhere. As some of you will remember, Matt Dunn served for four terms in the Vermont House of Representatives and for two terms in the Vermont State Senate. He was the Democrat Party's nominee for lieutenant governor in 2006 and ran for the party's nomination for governor in 2010 and 2016. Along the way, he also led the AmeriCorps VISTA program during the Clinton administration, then went on to run the Community Affairs Division for Google, the technology company. He helped launch the Center on Rural Innovation in 2017. Uh, as, as you may remember, we do a lot with data and mapping um, to be able to help uh, policymakers and philanthropists and investors understand rural America and the current economic crisis and the opportunities to unlock the potential of, of rural communities. Um, so what we thought was that we could use that understanding uh, to make sure we got beyond the headlines of huge uh, rates of contagion in urban places to help rural communities understand what is likely to be coming and how to prepare for infection rates that we knew were going to be on a per capita basis uh, comparable, if not worse, uh, than urban places. Uh, so we partnered with uh, Stat News. Uh, which is a, a news organization focused on healthcare, uh, as well as uh, New Lab, which is an organization out of, out of New York, uh, to build a preparedness index. Uh, and what that did is look at things like ICU beds, uh, medical staff, the socioeconomic conditions that are on the ground, which have a, a, a real impact in uh, being able to. Uh, uh, deal with uh, an infection like COVID-19. Uh, uh, also, second homes, uh, because as we've seen uh, in many places, uh, folks have fleed uh, urban areas for their second homes, increasing the population in ways that we just don't anticipate, particularly not uh, this time of year. Uh, and so we, we released that uh, two weeks ago, uh, it is being used uh, all over the country, which is great. Uh, and it's just trying to give another indicator uh, so that people can be looking uh, around the corner to understand what might be coming and where to focus resources in the short and, and longer term to make sure that those rural health facilities aren't overwhelmed. Well, uh, let's let's uh, drill down a little bit into uh, what some of the impacts might be on rural America uh, and the changes that will be coming in the in the wake of the uh, pandemic. Uh, a lot of your work uh, up to now has has involved uh, trying to uh, build rural economies and rural communities uh, back from the two thousand eight oh nine recession, where uh, a lot of those rural communities were were badly impacted by, by that economic downturn and, and struggled to recover over the next 10 years. And, you know, uh, the pessimistic view might be that, well, now we're going back down the slippery slope again. Um, but you were hopeful that high tech digital uh, factors might be brought into play to help revive some of those uh, struggling rural economies, I guess. Uh, what is your sense of how that might happen? I mean, in, in one possible way of looking at it, I suppose, might be that this is an opportunity to uh, really say, hey, we really do need to have robust broadband. We really do need to have uh, a strong digital 
you know, uh, element to those rural economies. Is that, uh, is that a direction you might see this all taking eventually? Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, beyond the immediate response where we were just trying to make sure that we were helping with the, the health crisis, uh, we, we think this is a real moment in time. Uh, for uh, companies and individuals to, to rethink uh, a overly urban-centric view of where uh, innovation, employment uh, can take place. Uh, it's also a moment in time to uh, think about uh, delivering the, on the promise of universal broadband, uh, because what COVID-19 uh, laid bare was the impacts of not having equitable uh, access uh, to broadband infrastructure. And it's, uh, it has it affected uh, employment options. Uh, if you don't have uh, high-speed internet, it's very difficult to continue to do your job in a distributed way, especially if it involves video conferencing. It is uh, leading to an education gap uh, where uh, young people who are now being asked to do their classwork uh, from home it's a very different experience for those who are dealing with satellite connections versus uh, fiber to the home. Uh, and the other is a real health issue. Um, you know, the recommendation right now is that most uh, vulnerable seniors should be doing their medical check-ins via video conference and telehealth. Well, that's all well and good if you have the broadband to be able to do that. And so those people who don't have that option are having to go into clinics, which is where the highest concentration of the infection is, and really put them at risk. Uh, so if there was ever a moment for the uh, rural electrification of our generation, this is it. And the good news is there are plenty of models to show it can be done. There just needs to be both the political will on making sure that there's the regulatory environment to allow for folks to build out that infrastructure, even if it might disrupt some current incumbents business plans, uh, as well as the, putting the resources down to make sure that we can do the uh, pre-development work to allow that to go forward. We've been involved in that kind of work uh, already on a, on a small scale, including in uh, Wyndham and uh, starting soon in Bennington uh, County, um, but it has to happen on a much uh, broader scale. Uh, beyond that, we also have a, a moment uh, to really rethink the workplace uh, and to understand that people can perform uh, technology jobs uh, from anywhere, as well as being able to build out new ideas uh, and, and innovations. Uh, and be able to bring them uh, to market. Uh, we need to uh, do that not only because there are going to be a lot of people who are uh, leaving urban places now and don't plan to come back, but also we are a stronger economy when we have a distributed economy. When you don't put all your eggs into the baskets of a few urban areas and you allow for uh, an, in an inclusive uh, economy, that is resilient to the, uh, the types of forces like automation. Uh, and then the final piece is uh, to that exact point. Uh, in 2008, what we saw after the recession was the acceleration of traditional rural jobs uh, uh, automated, right? They, they actually, they had already started down that path and when the economic shock hit, it just went much, much faster. We're already seeing that happen uh, across the country, whether it's in retail or making cheese or whatever else. I mean, there is a, a big move towards uh, automating it, so in, in some cases for health reasons, but also for economic reasons. Uh, and un unfortunately, uh, that uh, means that we need to be more committed than ever to building that infrastructure, that training, and the support of entrepreneurs to allow for those jobs to take place uh, in, in rural America uh, so that they're not left, we're not left behind uh, like we were uh, after the 2008 recession. We have a lot to learn from that economic shock, 
that we can put to work uh, now, um, but we have to get started immediately so that as people are enduring uh, unemployment rates similar to the Great Depression, they can use that time to reskill, reorient, get their idea to market so that come fall and winter, we are able to keep up with the kind of recovery that I think we're all hoping for. Um, so far, the uh, pandemic seems to have had its uh, most powerful impacts on urban areas in New York, uh, San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, and a few other places uh, have uh, been uh, badly hit, uh, more so than, uh, let's say, Vermont has or other rural states. Uh, fortunately. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd correct you on that. I, I would say in absolute numbers, that's the case. Um, but in many rural places, uh, particularly ones that did not take the kind of aggressive action that Vermont did of uh, asking people to please stay home and shutting down establishments that uh, accelerated the, uh, the, the um, spread of, of the virus, uh, you actually see rates on a per capita basis uh, that are similar to New York and LA and other places. Uh, and when you look at the actual infrastructure that's available for uh, ICU beds or uh, even the staff, uh, you know, you have, you have hospitals where in cities they would have an infection of a staff member and they'd say, all right, that shift, you know, needs to go into quarantine for two weeks and we'll have another shift come in and take over. Well, in a rural place where you only have one shift, that means the hospital shuts down. So the actual impact of this on rural places is uh, a little bit delayed uh, from urban. I think we're gonna see peaks that happen later, um, but is as high and potentially is higher uh, in, in terms of the, the, the real life impact uh, on its uh, community. Well, what I was uh, wondering about was uh, given, given all the, uh, shall we say, publicity that's been associated with the larger uh, rural uh, urban areas. Yeah. Uh, I found myself wondering if uh, three or four months ago before the pandemic took over everything, uh, we were all concerned about the, uh, the demographics of Vermont. Uh, we were an aging state. There was a stagnant population. How are we going to turn that around? You know, all the all the uh, momentum seemed to be uh, heading towards urban areas. That's where the jobs were um, and the job opportunities. I found myself wondering, gee, um, not that it's the way that anyone ever thought might be a way to repopulate the state, but might, might the experience of some of those urban areas make some of those folks there think, in addition to paying shockingly high amounts of money for rent, renting and buying property, but living in a rural state like Vermont or any other rural state you want to think of might not seem like such a bad idea, particularly if you can work remotely. Yeah, I, I think we have a window of opportunity to do just that. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be a window that's open forever. Uh, I think there is a moment where people and particularly families are rethinking uh, where they want to live. They're looking at the costs of that that are different, and they're looking at you know long term you know safety and disruption along with the the quality of life that we all know is uh, in many ways much higher in in rural places. Um, but we need to seize that moment. Uh, we need to make sure that we are showing that they can continue to pursue aspirational careers uh, in in a rural place that they'd rather be in general because there became this, this view that the only place you could have uh, an aspirational career was if you crammed yourself into a city and paid through the nose for housing and, uh, and, and had to, you know, uh, and had to live in a, in a subway for hours uh, a week. And, and that's not true, it wasn't true then, um, but we had lost so much ground on companies that were starting. The very few startups were happening from 2008 to, uh, to 2020 in rural America. Uh, there wasn't hiring that was going on. There wasn't proactive skill training uh, in the way that there could have been on the kinds of technology skills that would allow for people to, 
to work from there. And we just didn't do the job on broadband either. We made some headway, um, but we didn't create a universal broadband to make sure that that wasn't a barrier to one participating uh, in the global marketplace. And so we need to get on it again now. And, and it's hard, you know, just like us, you know, we started <laughs> diverting our, our tech and data team's time over to how do we help make sure that rural hospitals are not overwhelmed by the pandemic, but we have to be focused now to make sure that we are doing uh, job training uh, so that people who are unemployed are able to get distributed jobs as well as, uh, you know, software jobs that are, uh, you know, more than just tech enabled. Uh, we have to make sure that we are creating uh, accelerator opportunities for new business starts and we need to do that in a way that is uh, visible and high profile uh, to those folks who are either uh, here as our guests, having gotten out of the city, uh, or people who are considering uh, moving to a, a more rural area uh, so that they can make that leap and feel that they've made the right choice. I'm sure you probably know the answer to this better than I. Uh, has the federal government in uh, either the CARES 1 or CARES 2, the two, uh, uh, I guess you'd call them stimulus programs, uh, Congress has enacted, is there any money in there that's specifically allocated for uh, rural broadband development? No, that, that wasn't included. I mean, there's been significant tranches of money uh, appropriated over the last uh, couple of years uh, for broadband uh, expansion. Uh, there are some challenges with it uh, in that it, it was uh, large tranches for already uh, developed um, projects. So you had to actually have done all of the pre-work to be able to access those resources. And they were resources that were restricted in some really strange ways. So if there was a, a perception at all that your region or part of the state was already covered by another uh, federally funded program, you would be disqualified from being able to access those resources, even if there hadn't been you know, full deployment of uh, broadband to that, that area. Uh, so there are some some changes that need to happen to be able to make it uh, make the existing funding uh, be more effective, uh, as well as uh, uh, paying for that kind of pre-development work that allows a project to be shovel ready with a business plan, with a uh, a, a, a group of communities that can make a large enough customer base for it to work. Uh, but I am anticipating uh, there will be more money uh, coming down uh, the road, at least I, I would hope so, uh, because if there was ever a time, again, to do the rural electrification of our time, uh, th this is it. And I am I think that there may be a, a unique and rare bipartisan moment uh, to be able to make that kind of uh, bold initiative happen. Yeah, unique is <laughs> is definitely the right word for for that uh, these days. Um, one other thought that came to mind as you were talking, uh, we recently heard uh, about a, a plan uh, to close three campuses of uh, the Vermont State College system. Uh, as we all know, it's, they've been going through very difficult uh, financial situations for a while, and in some ways. It may not have been a big surprise when uh, the chancellor, uh, Jeb Spaulding, uh, who submitted his resignation earlier this week, uh, um, you know, proposed, made that proposal, which, of course, drew a, a huge outcry uh, against it, um, although I thought, you know, he, he might have well have had a point uh, about that. But clearly, um, keeping schools like that would seem to be even more important uh, nowadays than than ever. Um, I mean, is, would be keeping those three campuses, for instance, and maybe others like them elsewhere in other parts of the country, all the more important in in the light of uh, the need to train and upskill people to take these digital jobs that might well be the savior for a lot of rural economies. You know, look, 
uh, higher education is going through a massive amount of disruption right now, uh, especially as more and more courses are moving online. Uh, the cost of higher education is continuing to escalate. Uh, and in fact, the hiring practices that are taking place, even at tech companies, uh, is in some ways less dependent on you know where you went to school, but rather what you know and your ability to put a project together. Uh, all of that said, higher education, particularly in a place like Vermont, that what it has to uh, say for itself is that it's a beautiful place to be. Uh, it has strong, open-minded values uh, and is a, a place where we benefit from having more young people spending quality time here uh, and getting a little uh, addicted to the beauty and the lifestyle so that they stick around. Uh, is is super, super important. It's one of the best examples of what rural economies have to do, which is uh, import cash and export value. Uh, and that's, that's what higher education is all about. Uh, and unfortunately, Vermont has been going through a higher education Armageddon. Uh, the number of colleges that have closed in the state of Vermont over the last year uh, has been larger than I think over the last several decades. And that's, that's very, that should be very, very concerning. Uh, and I, I have to say, I think there would be a different view if that many businesses, you know, shuttered uh, their doors uh, with the kinds of jobs and economic impact that these happened. But they're uh, there oddly was not the kind of uh, rallying cry to figure out what's happening, what can we do, uh, and how can we make it um, uh, change. Because we're, we're not only losing the, the, the students uh, and the faculty positions, we're also losing the, the trailing spouses uh, who come along and bring their talents and skills to rural places to, to make it work and become, you know, the... The, the head of finance for a company or uh, a lead researcher for an environmental organization or whatever else. And we've, we've just been seeing that happen. So when the chancellor made the announcement, you know, it was uh, both, you know, deeply concerning and not a huge surprise. Uh, and it, but what we all have to understand is that if we allow for uh, those campuses uh, to close uh, and for, you know, VTC and all of its assets uh, to go to Williston, uh, which is in the center of one of the few places in Vermont that is doing well economically, uh, would, would do thing, two things. It would uh, accelerate uh, the two Vermonts uh, and it would uh, decrease the number of young people uh, who would be, you know, coming to Vermont or staying in Vermont. And I don't think either of those are in our uh, master plan for the next uh, 10 years. So uh, we, we need to dig deep as a state, uh, decide what it is that we want to do uh, with our state colleges and, uh, and our higher education uh, investment in general. Uh, and I'm hopeful that there will be a decision to come out of this uh, with a new uh, commitment to supporting those kinds of institutions and the potential they have. I mean, if you look at Randolph, you know, they, VTC had just gotten to the point where it was actually leading to tech transfer. You know, whether it was, you know, students and faculty uh, create, patenting uh, rocket technology uh, or LED companies that are now hiring dozens and dozens of people. So, we were just on the verge of allowing that institution to have the economic impact and unlock the potential in that part of central Vermont. And to have it uh, shuttered, I think, would be uh, a, a real step backwards. But it's not going to be a cheap solution. And it's going to mean uh, legislators uh, and, and the administration stepping up to prioritize uh, those dollars. And then Vermonters being able to understand. Uh, when that when that investment means that we need more revenue to be able to move us from point A to point B, right? Because uh, coming up with twenty five million dollars, which is what uh, they need to find in in addition to thirty million that they already are getting, is not going to be 
easy to come up with unless there's money in the federal uh, dollars that are coming into the state uh, can be allocated for that. But And I'm sure all of those are probably already have several claimants <laughs> speaking I, I, up for I, them. I am certain. But, <laughs> but again, those are the, this is a moment in time uh, when we can make that decision. And, and what's interesting is that when it's a private college or institution, you know, those, those you sometimes just chalk up to the, you know, the economics of the time and, uh, you know, how those organizations were being run by their boards of trustees and their president or wh whatever else. Uh, in moments of economic crisis like we're facing right now, public investment is what tends to carry you through and allows you to actually get a recovery. And so this is the moment. Uh, when we've been, you know, saving our rainy day dollars for uh, and being able to uh, hopefully have uh, some uh, willingness to come together as a state to raise the revenue to actually advance these kinds of causes and make sure that we have a, a place for many of our young people uh, to go within Vermont to get the excellent, excellent degrees that VTC provides. In fact, Folks coming out of VTC with a uh, computer software uh, engineering degree are snapped up before the end of February because they are such high quality. Uh, we need to double and triple down on that uh, to be able to make sure that we get out of the recovery and, and it's during an economic crisis uh, when it's most important to do that. All right. Well, we'll have to leave it there for now, uh, Matt, but thank you very much for your time today, uh, sharing your thoughts with us on this very important subject, uh, and, and good luck. Uh, hopefully uh, things over there on the other side of the state hold together well, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Next time, perhaps we can have the conversation right, right here in our, well, not this studio, but the other one up the street. <laughs> Excellent. I look forward to that. Uh, be safe and be well. Same to you. Thanks again. Thank you.